Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about best practices to build scalable React Native applications. I'd like to first thank All Things Open for organizing this amazing event. Although it's online, it takes a lot of effort to put up a show like this. Thank you, All Things Open, for inviting me here to speak and also for organizing a remote event like this amidst the pandemic. It's, it's great. Thank you. Who am I? I'm Aditi Ravichandran. I'm a software consultant based in Kansas City. I primarily work on building React Native apps, React apps, and I use GraphQL a lot as well. You can find me on Twitter at Aditi Ravi, or you can visit my website, aditiravichandran.com to learn more about me. We all know that React Native is used to build native cross-platform apps, primarily on iOS and Android. And it uses JavaScript and React to do that. In this talk, I'm going to address some lessons, concerns, and just tips that you can use to build your React Native apps that I've learned while building React Native apps in the last four years. Let's jump right in. The first topic that I want to talk about is iOS versus Android. You see here that these two cartoon characters are fighting between iOS versus Android. And I'd like to talk about the differences that you'll notice while building React Native apps between iOS and Android. So we know that we've picked React Native because we want to build cross-platform native apps and have the maximum code reuse. I can vouch for the code reuse part of it. And in the last four years with building React Native apps, I've noticed about 90% code is reused between the two platforms. This is actually a pretty high number. If you think about it, all of your code is entirely written in JavaScript using React, and you're building Android apps and iOS apps. And if you're going to get between 85 to 90% of code reuse, I think that's a big win for us. And React Native is pretty good at that, which is why it is probably popular too. But there are some challenges that you will see which are platform specific while developing React Native apps. The first thing you'll notice is the tool set. If you're not building your React Native apps using Expo, and if you're using React Native CLI to build your app, then you'll have a vast variety of tools that you have to be familiar with as a developer. While using iOS, you're going to be dealing with Xcode a lot. And while building Android apps, you're going to be using the Android Studio. You can't really get away from these tools because we need these tools to start up our emulators, deploy our code, and things like that. This is quite a learning curve for developers who don't have a mobile background. But there are courses that you can take on Xcode and Android Studio and familiarize yourself with them before you start building your app. The next big difference that you'll notice while building React Native apps is that some of the native components look very different cross-platform. An example on this would be the calendar component. The calendar component would look like this on iOS and completely different on Android. The strategy that you need to use is to respect this difference and go with it. Because React Native is essentially a wrapper that's translating the code into native components. So when the native components are translated, they look different across different devices because iOS and Android have different design paradigms. So we want to respect these differences and keep them consistent. You may have clients who may not like these differences and may not understand that these native components could look different across different devices. The advice is not to try and make an iOS component look like an Android component or the vice versa, because by doing that, we're defeating the purpose of code reuse and that kind of code becomes hard to maintain and the performance may not be as good because they're not native components anymore. So we probably need some kind of education for clients who don't understand that Native components look different on different platforms, and that's just what it comes with. And we also need to explain to them the cost that could come when we have to make these components look very similar across devices. 
So this is something that you'll have to deal with when you do React Native. The other difference that you'll see between iOS and Android is the release process. For iOS, we would use the Apple Store for our release process, and that's usually more stringent. And the review with App Store takes a few days because a physical person is actually reviewing your app, making sure that all the checks and balances are there. Whereas when you're going to release an Android app, it goes through Google Play and it's usually automated and very fast. When we get into the nitty gritty details of the code, there are platform specific styles that you could use. And I find this really useful. There's what's called the platform.select. And I use that a lot to have platform specific styles. If you look at this code snippet here, we import platform, an API that comes out of the box with React Native. And in my container style here, I'm using platform.select and I'm selecting um, iOS as a platform and Android as the other platform. And I'm setting two different background colors depending on which platform it is. Code snippets like this are very common and you would use them a lot in React Native to deal with some differences that you want to tackle between your different platforms. You could also have a platform for your TV and your Windows as well. Another feature that you could use with React Native is platform specific files. For instance, if you have an extension of your file that says mycomponent.ios.js, that's going to have platform specific details for iOS. And a component that says mycomponent.android.js is going to be your platform specific file for Android. So React Native is smart enough to detect which component to render because it can detect the device that you're using. And if you're using an Android device, it would render the My Component with Android.js extension. And if you're using an iOS device, it would detect it and render the file appropriately. This is a feature I've used very rarely, and some of the developers probably never even use this feature, but it's out there to help you if you want some custom code that needs to be separated out across different files. Some challenges that you would notice building React Native apps cross-platform is that as developers, we are inclined to test on our personal devices. So what ends up happening is if you have an iPhone, you're going to test more on iPhone. If you have an Android device, you're going to test more on Android device, leaving the other device to be kind of like a, you know, lagging behind. So we want to avoid that. And Another thing you'll notice is that developers run only one emulator at a time, and that's usually the iPhone emulator. Because to run the Android emulator does take up more memory for some reason, and things get slower. So we usually just run one emulator at a time. So bugs that come up, which you would have caught otherwise while development, are caught later on after deployment. So some of the strategies that we can use to overcome these challenges include developing with both iOS and Android emulators. It's easier said than done. So what we can do is maybe have few developers use iOS emulators for a week and the other set of developers use Android emulators. And then after a week, they rotate and switch around. This is just to make sure that we catch our issues as we code, which is the best time to catch them and fix them instead of having deployed and then testing it on a physical device and then finding out there's a problem. The other thing that I highly recommend is automating both your Android and iOS releases. This would take a huge burden away from the developer to physically come and try to release these things. Instead, if all of your release processes are automated, things go by pretty quickly and testing is more frequent. The other tip would be to maximize the devices. Make sure that you get a hold of as many different devices as possible across different platforms, different devices of different screen widths and heights and so on to catch your bugs across different devices. Also, the rule of thumb is to test early and often. The point I'm trying to make here is basically treat Android and iOS as equals 
And don't try to differ testing one or the other based on your preference, because when we do that and find bugs later on, it becomes hard and the turnaround time to fix them is also pretty slow. All right, so the next topic that I wanna touch here is organizing our styles. React Native is a framework that's heavy on the UI and styling is an important piece of React Native. Let's take a look at this code snippet here, which does inline styling. I have a component called my component and I have a view and within the view, I have some text that's getting displayed. But if you look at this, it's not really readable. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. My view style has been set, my text style has been set, and the style involves a lot of stuff. Like I have flex, I have a padding, a background color, font, font size, and so on. It's gonna be pretty hard to maintain code that looks like this because number one, it's hard to read. And number two, it's gonna take me a long time to figure out where an issue is and change a style. And this doesn't look reusable at all. An alternative to this would be to organize your styles instead of using inline styles. In React Native, we use something called stylesheet.create method. And on the left side, you can see I have a separate file called appstyle.js. And I put all my styles in that file. And within a component on the right side, I import that style. So I'm importing styles from app style, which is a file, and I'm passing that style to my prop style. This is a much better and cleaner way to style your components and keeping them separate is really cool because then you can reuse the style across several components. And if you're reusing them, if you're gonna make one change, that change is gonna reflect upon on all the components that use that style. This is cleaner, easier to maintain and reusable as well. Let me show a quick example of this in action. Notice here that I have a component and it displays three boxes, box one, box two, and box three. And notice here that all of the styles are passed as a prop to these components and they come from a different file. There's no styling in this file at all. So if I open appstyle.js, you can see all of the styling for that component being defined here within the stylesheet.create method. This is very consistent with how we style React Native components and you can have several components and styles corresponding to those components placed in a different file. To recap, organizing your style has several perks. You can reuse your style across components, write maintainable code. And one more thing is this kind of code is easier to test as well. All right. The next topic that I wanna to touch is the one with hooks. As you all know, React has introduced hooks and it's being used in React Native as well. These days I've been writing all my components as functional components that use hooks rather than class components. It definitely makes our code a lot more easier to you know, read and it gets rid of all those life cycle methods that we used to use previously in class components. And probably most of us didn't understand the life cycle methods very well. Also having the ability to access state within a functional component using hooks is a big win in my opinion. And we also definitely see some amount of performance improvements with using functional components rather than class components. In this section, I just wanted to show some React Native specific hooks that you can utilize in your project, which would be very handy and helpful. The most common hook that I use is the use keyboard hook. This comes with the React Native community. There is a community repo called hooks and that has a whole bunch of hooks that I use for my React Native projects. The use keyboard hook is one of the most frequently used hooks by me. And that really helps you in telling you whether a keyboard is currently displayed the height of the keyboard and the coordinates. You know that the mobile has very limited real estate and every time our virtual keyboard comes up, we need to account for you know, how much space is it occupying, are other text visible in spite of the keyboard being shown. 
do I have to scroll up a little bit and things like that. Every time the keyboard is shown, the hook is gonna get updated and the Boolean value would be true. And if it's not shown anymore, it's gonna be updated. And you don't need any event handling code to um, figure out those things because they are done behind the scenes. And it definitely makes your code less verbose, the least to say. The other hook that is very similar to the use keyboard is the use dimensions hook. And this would be also from the React Native community. And it can tell you your width and height of your window, as well as the width and height of your screen. Again, if, the, if there are any changes, it's going to account for that. And there won't be any kind of event handling that you need to do. And because these hooks do the event handling behind the scene. The other useful hook is to know the app state. It would tell you whether your app is inactive, active, or backgrounded currently, and the status changes based on the user's interaction with the app. Another one that I like to use is the use color scheme. And this comes out of the box with React Native. This is not from the community. And this tells you whether the current color scheme of the user's device is on light mode or dark mode. And depending on that mode, you can probably make some styling changes for your app. So this is quite useful um, if your users really like the dark mode and would like your app to correspond to it. Another useful one is on accessibility info, which comes from the community as well. It's called the Use Accessibility Info, and it gives you information on whether the device has accessibility features turned on or off. You can see if the reduce motion is enabled, if a screen reader is enabled, and it also keeps track of when it's turned off and when it's turned on, so you can have your app act, you can have your app act accordingly. If your app responds to the device orientation changes, then this hook is very useful called the use device orientation. So you can identify if the user's device is currently with the portrait orientation or whether it's switched to landscape. And again, depending on whether your app reacts to those, you can use this hook. The next topic that I'd like to touch is the performance. Mobile apps have to perform really well. In fact, I think mobile apps have to perform better than websites because when you're a mobile user, your patience level is probably a little bit lesser because you're using your app in your personal device, most likely. And you want that app not to be slowing down your general work because your mobile is used for so many other personal things. You don't want an app that performs slowly. The first thing you're gonna notice is the size of the app and the performance. And as an end user, if you think it's not doing well in terms of performance and eating up the memory of your phone, you're just gonna uninstall that app. So performance is huge on mobile apps and could be a big turnoff for end users if it doesn't perform well. So I'd like to touch some topics related to performance with React Native. First things first, use Hermes. Hermes is a JavaScript engine optimized for running React Native apps on Android. This is fairly new and was released last year. Until Hermes was introduced, a lot of React Native developers and end users have noticed that the performance on Android, especially, has not been that great. And Hermes solves this problem for us. And the Facebook team created a completely new JavaScript engine that was highly optimized and performed very well for Android. Um, so please make sure that you use Hermes because a lot of the performance related problems that you see on Android can be completely changed and solved if you use the Hermes engine. It improves the start time of your Android app. It decreases the memory usage and the overall bundle or the app size is smaller as well. Keep in mind that Hermes is available for React Native version 0.60.4 or more. So if you're on a version lower than 0.60.4, then you don't have access to use Hermes. So maybe it's worthwhile to upgrade to the latest version of React Native so you can utilize the benefits of the Hermes engine. Again, Hermes is optional. So make sure that you go through the React Native documentation 
to understand how to enable Hermes for your Android devices. Some little things that you can do in your code to make sure that the performance is pretty good is making sure that you run animations on the native driver. Take a look at this code sample here where I use the animated API. And I've added a prop called use native driver and I've set the value of that prop to true. Make sure you do this anytime you use animations because as the name suggests, it's gonna run your animations on the native driver. If you don't set this prop, it's gonna run them on the JavaScript side, making things slow. It took me a while to realize this was happening, but when I simply made this switch and added this prop, a lot of my animation problems and performance issues were just gone. So make sure that you add that prop for your animations as well. Almost always use flat list or section list for any of your list components. If you have a huge list that you wanna render, use either one of them, depending on your use case. If you have sections that you need to display with your list, make sure you use section list. If you don't need sectional um, support, just make sure you use the flat list. This is the performance list that's used in React Native. And if you're still using list view, make sure you get away from it. This point is applicable for React as well. And since React Native uses React, it's the same concept. Make sure that you use key attributes on list items. Take a look at this code snippet here. We have a, a my component class, and you can notice here that I have a list of text that I am displaying. Since it is a list, I'm making sure that I set a key. And this key is a unique ID that we need to set. And every time you have a list of items, you almost always have to have a key for it. This is because without a unique key for each item, React will re-render every time you add or remove an item. And we don't want that because that's gonna be a severe hit on your performance. This is something you may forget. Um, so React does give you warnings and if you have ESLint enabled, you can see these warnings come up as well. So make sure that you provide a key for list items to enhance your performance. Something quite new in the React Native world is the pressable component. The pressable component is basically something similar to the touchable components like touchable opacity and touchable highlight and so on, just that it's better. So uh, make sure that you use the pressable component going forward instead of the touchable ones because React Native says it's way more performant and it also supports things like on long press. For example, you're gonna have a user that's gonna press you know, maybe a few milliseconds longer than usual, it's gonna account for that. It's also gonna capture touches outside of pressable areas because sometimes, you know, there's only so much area and you could accidentally slip away and press right next to a button and you think you already pressed it. So the pressable component has options where it can be smart enough to recognize that the user did touch that area, but just slightly outside. And it also supports things like the ripple effect with Android. So it's significantly better extensible with more features compared to the touchable uh, components and definitely use them in future projects. There's also documentation, which is quite extensive on different things, techniques you can use to improve your performance and also debug performance related issues. So make sure you check out this link to learn more about them. The next controversial topic in React Native is really navigation. Navigation is basically moving from a screen to another screen. And this is an important decision that you take before you start developing your React Native app. You have to pick a navigation library because rest assured, your app is gonna have a lot of screens and needs a navigation methodology. A little history on navigation. Yep, take a look at that. That's the number of libraries that are available for you to pick from. And that's an overwhelmingly large list. So what do we do now? <laughs> so um, I have used a bunch of libraries like the Navigation Experimental, Navigator, Navigation iOS, Native Navigation, 
And finally, I'm using React Navigation now. As you can see, I've striked out each one of them because they didn't work. They didn't work for me or they were not desirable. If you're starting with React Native now, you're at a much better space because you don't need to try out all these experimental navigation libraries. You don't need to write your own navigation library. The best bet for you would be using React Navigation. So React Navigation is the most used navigation library for React Native. It's in version five, it's stable, and it's definitely customizable and works very well with both iOS and Android. So skip away all the experimental stuff and go right into React Navigation. And if you really want something that is more native, you want 100% native platform navigation for both iOS and Android, then there's an alternative called React Native Navigation, which is by Wix. And that's a really good library as well. I haven't used it personally, but I know a lot of folks use it and it would be definitely worth a try. So you have two options if you're using navigation. It's either React Navigation or React Native Navigation. And these are both safe bets for you if you're starting today. All right, so the next topic I wanna to touch is third-party libraries. We really don't wanna reinvent the wheel on every single thing when we build our React Native applications. There are plenty of third-party libraries in the community that you can use and solve the problems that you're trying to solve. So the React Native community is a huge repo of plenty of resources. The React Native community, as you can see here, is got about 40 repositories and it is managed by the core contributors of React Native and some active participants in the React Native community. I'm going to go check out some of these repositories here. You can see um, there is a React Native device info. There's one on modal. There's one on hooks, which I was just talking to you about previously. There's also the React Native camera, which is an awesome camera component for React Native. And I use it on any projects that need a camera support. There's also cool things like React Native net info. There is the upgrade support. React Native SVG, which is basically a library of uh, React Native, React Native Web, and plain React projects uh, with SVG icons. There is also things like React Native geolocation. These are complex problems. You don't want to reinvent the wheel to solve these things because we have vetted libraries that are available that integrate well with your React Native projects. There's also things like React Native video, sound, and so on. So, so make sure that you come here and check out the repositories that are available in the community before you decide to code a humongous project that needs a feature that's probably already figured out and solved and ready for you to use. As we talk about utilizing third-party libraries, it's also a responsibility to make sure that we open source our work to help the community as well. React Native is hugely dependent on the community collaborations and helping the community is absolutely important. Um, if you do have a cool project or a cool problem you've solved for React Native, consider making it open source so that the rest of the community can benefit from it as well. The next topic I want to touch, which is very close to my heart, is building accessible applications. As a software developer, it's our moral responsibility to build accessible applications. And we know that a lot of people in the world have different kinds of disability. And if they were to use our app, and we could support some amount of accessibility for our end users with disability, I think it's a big win for us. So let's take a look at what React Native can do in terms of providing accessibility options, and we can utilize that as a developer. On iOS, there's something called the screen reader that's available. So if you go into the settings and click on accessibility, we have a voiceover app, and enabling that is going to make sure that whenever there's accessibility features in your app, the voiceover would read out those to the end user. 
On Android, the screen reader is called TalkBack. Again, you can go into settings and click on accessibility and turn on the TalkBack. So once you have your screen readers enabled and then code for accessibility, you can test them and make sure that the screen reader is actually capturing those and reading it out to you. The first thing you would do is detect the state of the device and make sure that the end user's device does have accessibility features turned on. As we talked about earlier, to do that, we're gonna use the use accessibility info hook that comes with the React Native community. And it can detect things like whether a reduced motion is enabled, if a screen reader, just like we saw earlier, is enabled on the device. And depending on whether those are enabled or disabled, the accessibility features in your code can be turned on as well. So this is hugely important step where you first detect the state of your end user's device. Here is an example of an accessible component. It's simple, but it conveys the idea here. Take a look at our touchable opacity. I have a prop called accessible, and I'm setting that to true. This is the very first step you would do in saying that that component is accessible. And I'm also giving it an accessibility label that says go back. So when the end user clicks on that button, it's going to read out, the screen reader would read out saying go back. And I'm also providing an additional accessibility prop called accessibility hint. And that's going to say something further. It's going to say something more than the label. It says navigates to the previous screen. So the label is good enough and the hint gives you a little bit more context after reading out the label. So you have to make a judgment on what you need to add and what is whether a hint is necessary or not. But these are all the features that are available to you out of the box with React Native and would be hugely beneficial if you have them set up so that somebody with a screen reader can actually hear these. There's also another uh, prop that we used here within our view component called accessibility rule that tells us what that component is acting like. Its role is to be basically a button. You get the idea. Let's go into our accessibility API. And there's a lot more props and features that you can utilize while developing your React Native code. Here we are with the official accessibility API documentation. And you can see here on the right, all this. Label, hint, all of the stuff which is other interesting ones. For example, it does is it describes the current one. We also have a platform, for example, for our web for example, and So keep that in mind when you're developing your React Native apps. So the next topic that I like to touch is testing. Quality means doing it right, even when no one is looking. This is a quote by Henry Ford, and I think this rings a bell to me as a software developer, and this quote is applicable to us software developers too. Quality is something we need to care about in our software, not wait until like a bug shows up or somebody asks us for a status for QA, but testing needs to be an integral part of our development process. For React Native apps, you could do unit testing, component testing, integration testing, and so on. The unit testing framework you could use for React Native is similar to whatever you would use for React. Something like Jest would work perfectly fine. I've been using detox tests for integration tests, which are basically end-to-end -end tests. And detox tests your mobile app while it's running in a real device or your simulator. And it interacts with it just like a real user. You can 
think of detox tests as something very similar to Cypress if you've used it for the web. It basically runs these end-to-end -end tests and tests your application as a whole. And these tests are really helpful and also makes a lot of sense for the QAs and everybody else in the company who's not a developer, because they can literally see this happen, this automated test running uh, on your device or emulator like a robot, basically. So instead of somebody clicking through all these things manually, we have an automated test that takes care of it and runs an end-to-end -end test. So this is absolutely important and useful. So I highly recommend checking out an end-to-end -end test framework like Detox for React Native Apps. As we talked about, detox testing emulates a user testing experience, and they like to call themselves a gray box test, not a black box test, because there's some amount of monitoring your app from within the app itself. And it definitely automates a lot of your manual QA process and your QAs will really appreciate you including tests like these. And Detox tests are simple to write and they're written entirely in JavaScript, so it's easy to read and write. This is an example of a simple detox test. Let's look at how the structure of a detox test looks. Some of these keywords like describe, before each, and it, these are keywords you may have seen in other testing frameworks and detox utilizes the same as well. Describe is used to give a name for your test suite and it gives a name for each test. As you can guess, before each is a snippet that runs before running your test. And it is where your test is being running. So we have a test that says should have welcome screen and it's having an async await option that expects an element and that elements ID has to be welcome and it checks if it is visible. So if you read through these, you can realize that a lot of these really look like simple English. If you take a look at the second one, it's having an async await again, and we're waiting for the hello button. And when it appears, we tap it, which probably means our detox test is gonna automate a tap. And once it's tapped, it's expecting an element of uh, text hello to be visible. So the idea is there is a hello button and you're going to tap it. And once it's tapped, it's going to say hello. It's pretty intuitive and even QAs can get involved and write some detox tests and developers should absolutely write some. So I highly recommend testing your application thoroughly in terms of unit tests, component tests and integration tests. And all of these is going to do quite a lot of sanity check for your application before they're released. After all, testing makes you ship code with confidence and that's what we're really aiming for here. The final topic that I'd like to touch here is continuous delivery. We're developing these mobile applications and we wanna deliver them to our clients, our testers continuously as we develop. We don't want to wait for five months or six months until we develop and send these applications to our clients. To do that with React Native, I found that Fastlane is one of the fastest and easiest methods to automate your deployments. You can automate both beta deployments and releases with Fastlane. The things that Fastlane does for you is all the frustrating stuff that mobile developers face when they release an app. Things like generating screenshots, code signing, releasing your application, and with respect to beta deployments too, Fastlane is super useful. And for beta deployments, I use TestFlight for iOS and Google Play for Android. TestFlight is basically an application where you can include tons of beta testers and release your app to TestFlight. And the beta testers can download the latest version of your beta app from TestFlight and basically utilize your latest and greatest and send feedback to you. You can do the same concept with Google Play as well and build and develop a beta version of your app on Google Play and send feedback to you. You can do the same concept with Google Play as well and build and develop a beta version of your app on Google Play that your Android beta testers can utilize. The reason beta testing is important is making sure that your app is in the hands of plenty of beta testers, thoroughly battle tested, 
before you can release it to prod. And this is how your test flight looks on for iOS. You can notice that we have the builds, different versions. You also have like the external testers and a group of internal testers you can add. So highly recommend this workflow where you have Fastlane set up on all your developers' machines so you can release frequently without any pain. And I also recommend using beta deployments using things like Test Flight and Google Play and get your apps tested before you release them through prod. I'd like to conclude by saying it's a great time to be working on React Native. Building React Native apps are absolutely fun. At the same time, it comes with a lot of challenges if you're aiming to build scalable applications with React Native. Definitely consider the things we talked about in this talk, things like performance, accessibility, navigation, testing, just to name a few. I'd like to answer any questions you have right now in the chat, or you can ping me at Aditi Ravi on Twitter, and I'm available to answer any questions you may have about React Native. Again, I'd really like to thank All Things Open for organizing such a wonderful event. Although it's remote, it's been a great experience for me participating in it. And I look forward to the rest of the talks and the conference too. It's been one of my favorite conferences that I've been going to. And unfortunately, with the pandemic going on, this is the best we can do. Hopefully next year, we can make it to North Carolina. Thank you again, All Things Open, for having me here. And it's been a pleasure. Definitely ask me any questions you'd like, and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm here for questions, if you have anything. Thank you, Adizi. Do we have questions? Do you have any security tips for React Native? Uh, with respect to security, there is like things like Keychain that I use as a library called React Native Keychain. And a lot of the um, security aspects are also handled on the server side um, in terms of tokens and things like that. So, yep, I hope that answered that. How often do you have to drop into native code? Um, very uh, infrequently on my end, um, probably maybe 5% of the time for both Android and iOS, we try to do um, some custom coding on the native side, but um, we do have a ton of code close to 90% shared. So I don't do a lot of native coding and didn't have to. Any other questions? Um, Expo, what do you think of Expo? I really love Expo. Um, I've used it on a few projects and um, Expo is great if you don't wanna do any um, native coding as we talked about previously. And it is, it is super easy to set up and get going, but I do notice that if you want your uh, app on the app store and want a lot of flexibility in general, um, you probably don't wanna go Expo route. If you like native coding, if you wanna have, you know, uh, a lot of native developers on your team who like it, then you probably want to leverage that because when you use Expo, you can't really do any native coding at all. So it kind of adds an abstraction on top of React Native. It's good for those who want quick uh, projects and they want to finish things up pretty quick and the turnaround time with Expo is really fast. Um, but if you want way more flexibility and want to customize, probably Expo is not the way. It just depends on your use case. Yeah, a lot of the people are actually not aware of these um, extensions is what I uh, heard, because um, I also rarely use it, but um, I did find that on the documentation some time ago and started using it for some, um, some projects. Yep. 